a dull hammer. Good evening and welcome to Borough Hall. There are four items on the agenda this evening. Please note that this, is, this hearing is being recorded to comply with the public law for transparency. It will be available for viewing on Borough President Adams' website, brooklyn-usa.org, or on the Bro One Brooklyn channel on YouTube. Web viewers may submit timely comments to askeric at brooklynbp.nyc.gov. For Borough President Adams' consideration, I'd like to just introduce myself. My name is Diana Reina, and I'm the Deputy Brooklyn Borough President. With me are the Land Use Director, uh, Richard Bayrak, and Olga Cherromoretz, who is the Land Use Coordinator. Thank you so much for being here with us. Uh, please call the first item. Calendar item number 1170316, PCK. This application submitted by the New York City Department of Parks and Recreation seeks acquisition and site selection of a 6,000 square foot property located in the Prospect Lefferts Garden neighborhood of Brooklyn Community District 9. Such actions would allow for continued use of this property as a passive open space and community garden. Should this application be approved, Borough President Adams has allocated $750,000 of his capital budget to provide the opportunity to acquire this space. Community Board 9 approved this application on April 25th, 2017. With the representative for this application, Kelsey Wickle. Did I pronounce that correctly? Mm -hmm. Excellent. Please state your name for the record and present the application. Hello, my name is Kelsey Wickle. I'm a project planner with the Parks Department here to present our uh, application for Maple Street Open Space and Garden. As you mentioned, The Department of Parks and Recreation, along with the Department of Citywide Administrative Services, is seeking approval for the acquisition of this lot uh, by the city and site selection of Brooklyn Block 5030, Lot 72. Uh, the lot was the site of a single family detached home, uh, which became vacant after the death of its residents. It burned down and was demolished by HPD in 1997. The lot sat vacant between 1997 and 2013. In 2013, neighborhood residents raised funds and worked to transform the lot into a community space to grow fresh produce and provide open space by removing debris, building garden beds, and landscaping the site. Gardeners first installed beds in 2013 and continued to do so in 2014. Also in 2014, a dispute arose as to who has title to the site. This matter is currently being litigated in Kings County Supreme Court. Today, the project site has been partially improved with garden beds, seating, landscaping, a small one-story shed, and composting facilities. The project site is surrounded by single-family detached and multifamily residential buildings with a height of two to three stories and is zoned R6 for medium density residential. Immediately to the west of the site are mixed-use residential and commercial buildings with a height of three stories and a commercial overlay C2-3. The city and non-city facilities located within a half mile radius of the project site include schools, parks, daycare facilities, food pantries, medical treatment clinics, fire and police stations. Brooklyn Community Board 9 is identified as having a low open space ratio of 0 0.8 acres of open space per 1,000 residents. Moreover, a portion of the Prospect Leopards neighborhood is currently located outside of a walk to a park, and the acquisition of this parcel will bring approximately 3,000 New Yorkers within a, a walk to a park. Parks proposes maintaining the project site's current use as a passive open space and garden. There is no plan to change the build form of the project site. 
Upon acquisition, Parks plans to install new fencing and signage, repair the sidewalk in front of the site, and make minor improvements to the site's passive open space area. Improvements would occur after the acquisition of the lot, and once Parks has consulted the community regarding improvements to the site. Uh, as was mentioned, a portion of the project site would be licensed, maintained, and used as a Green Thumb Community Garden, while another part of the lot would be designated and maintained as public open space for passive recreation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, our office has been involved with this particular lot, um, actively just monitoring the site and the fraudulent uh, history of the lot, working with uh, civic organizations as well as gardeners. Um, we are very much satisfied with the fact that we're working with the Department of Parks and Recreation in order to salvage what is this lot as a garden um, and we are closely monitoring what is the activity in court. Mm -hmm. um, I want to just make sure that I ask uh, several questions. Given some of the improvements and programming envisioned by the gardeners, which are dependent on securing the property, if all goes as antip anticipated, what would be the effective date of formal community garden status? So we anticipate that, uh, well, we're, still determining how best to acquire the site, but we believe that acquisition could occur sometime in the spring or summer of 2018, at which point the gardeners could be licensed immediately. And could you please explain why in this case is there not also an application to map the property as park? Yes, we are choosing to site select the property uh, instead of map it to allow for continued garden use. Gardens do not fall under park's legal definition for a park purpose, and therefore if we were to map as a park, the garden could not continue to operate. And so just for the sake of clarity, if this was de designated as a park under the parks and recreation um, parks provision, it would not allow the use of gardening. Yes. And so a park technically designated as a park could not have a, let's say, friends of garden in that park? It could not. It, there are several reasons. Uh, composting, for one, is not allowed in a park. Uh, and there's also the issue of uh, potential access. Gardens are not necessarily available to the public during all hours. This mm -hmm. is a slightly different case. And also, finally, gardening is, does not qualify as what is identified as a park purpose in the zoning definition of a, and legal definition of a park. And do you have that legal definition with you? I'm happy to share it with you at a later time. I don't I would have it. I love that. Thank you so much. I just wanted to make sure that we have uh, a clear definition on file. Sure. Um, and, you know, this particular definition um, has brought attention to the fact that uh, if a friend's group wanted to garden, is that prohibited on a park? Sure. And so we're raising just inquiries internally as to well, how does a friends group activate what would be gardening on a park if this is a provision that does not, it does not permit what would be gardening? Sure. Thank you. I'd like to just thank the partnership of the Parks and Recreation uh, staff and the support, and uh, we look forward to a successful conclusion of this particular lot. Um, it is bittersweet to hear uh, how this all transpired, um, but we look forward to uh, what is a favorable uh, open space uh, equity uh, increase to the neighborhood mm -hmm. of the community. Thank and you. Anything further, uh, please keep us informed. Will do. Thank, Thank you. you. I'd like to call upon Maple Street Open Space 
and Garden, Thomas Lafarge. followed by Arlene Roberts, followed by Diane Lent. Thank you very much, Vice President. I'm Thomas Lafarge from the Maple Street Community Garden. That's the name we've been working under until now, and we are a community garden. Um, we have been busily addressing the question. You can the lift question. the mic up a little bit. We've been actively addressing the question in community board meetings of how a garden serves a community. And I thought I would say a word about that right now. Um, there are a number of ways which other members of the garden will address, the recreational facilities, the composting program. To me, the one that matters the most is to have uh, the, the various residents of a very diverse neighborhood working together to make something happen, to make something grow in a space. It's very healthful, very peaceful work, and it has to be done collaboratively. You should know that the Maple Street uh, Garden does not uh, give out individual allotments to its members. Instead, all of the growing beds are managed collectively, and the harvest is distributed among those who grow it and anybody else from the community who wants to come in and take it. So it's open to anybody. I wanted to give you a question that you might have in mind is how large a community does a community garden serve? And I have a few numbers to share with you that will illustrate that. There are 211 households, not individuals, but households, which are signed up to receive emails on our, the larger of our two mailing lists. So all of those people hear all of the news about meetings and events and potluck get-togethers and work days over the course of a growing season and are asked for money periodically too, of course. We have memberships. Uh, there are they cost $20 a year, and you have to commit to doing some work on one of the garden's uh, several committees. We have 60 households that are currently signed up in 2017 that are current with their dues that are, um, that are members. And there are 63 households signed up on the gardening committee alone. Not all of those people show up every time there's a work day to help do the gardening work but many of them do. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Thomas. And I just wanted to take a moment as chair prerogative to thank you for your leadership and tenacity and love of gardening um, to provide your community more open space. Thank you so much. Arlene? Good evening, everyone. My name is Arlene Roberts, and I've been a member of the garden since 2014. On any given Saturday, you would find me emptying the compost, the scraps from the, the compost bins. Uh, I'm also the water's arena, so in the summertime, I'm responsible for refilling the water barrels to provide irrigation to our water beds. Initially, I started gardening out of personal interest and in a desire to interact with members in the community. And then I also started taking my niece, my nieces rather, 10 and four, to the garden for social events. But one of the highlights for the garden for me was when we hosted the uh, Girl Scouts, uh, St. Gabriel's group, uh, group 2115 at our community garden last summer, when they came by to do their community service and also to uh, learn about gardening with the members. It was a good chance for them to earn their badges and it was very educational for many of them. And I'm hoping that's one of the long-term projects we can do more partnerships, educational and otherwise, with various groups in the community. Thank you. Thank you so much, Arlene. I'd like to ask Diane Lent. Excellent. Bless you. Good evening, thank you for the opportunity to present to you. Um, Prospect Lovers Garden is a very community-oriented community. And um, people are very proud to live there and 
um, be part of it. And so what we can do with this new open space is provide a place where people can meet. Um, when we get to the point where we can have open events there, we're very looking forward. My pet, pet that I'd like to have is a, um, like a music and art festival from the PLG Arts Committee. This is, uh, we were at Community Board 9 last week, and this is us when they approved uh, that we would, um, that we were approved by the Community Board, and so that was a big victory. And um, also this presents a really great place for children Diana, and families. Can you share that? Sure. This way? Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. Or you can you. even play some of these. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So it provides a, a great place for people to bring their children. The children get involved in the gardening. Um, we would also look forward to being able to work with schools in the area to have children learn gardening. Um, right now it's spring and we are, um, we are planting. And uh, the, the food is shared by the community and um, the seeds are coming up and it's very exciting. And, um, and so we look forward to another many years of pr providing food and one idea we have is to maybe provide food and some flowers for um, shut-in seniors and also a space for seniors who can stop there and be there. So um, it really it enriches our community and um, we hope that we can continue and, and expand this project. Thanks. Thank you. I'd like to call Mara Fravitz from 596 Acres and Gabriela Sayas of Maple Street Garden. Good evening, everybody. My name is Mara Kravitz, and I'm the Director of Partnerships at 596 Acres, which is New York City's Community Land Access Advocacy Organization. We've been working with the gardeners to support them through the process of uh, protecting their land from deed fraud um, by connecting them to legal representation, um, and also through this, um, pro this public review process and um, I'm so grateful to Borough President Eric Adams for, and your office and staff for supporting this place by allocating funding to, towards its acquisition. Um, I think what's really exciting is just to see residents working together with elected and appointed representatives, city agencies, local organizations um, like us to um, secure land for community use. And I think it's going to just get better and better as more and more partnerships are formed, um, which will become more possible as the land is secured as a public resource. So again, thanks so much for acknowledging um, the incredible resource that you all created um, and uh, protecting its future. Thank you so much. Mara, and send my regards and speedy recovery to uh, Paula, who has been a staunch advocate and just relentless individual uh, representing the legal component of uh, what has been a long road, um, but nonetheless, a very favorable one. Thank you so much. Thank you. Gabriela. Hello everyone, my name is Gabriela Sayas, and first I would like to talk about uh, the compost committee in which I am a member of. So the compost committee basically runs on a weekly basis and we both have scrappers. Arlene is a member of our scrapper team and we also have a turning team, the one that I belong to. And every other weekend I am there either on a Saturday or on a Sunday um, moving piles and piles of compost and also interacting with the community and teaching them a little bit more about what happens when they drop their food scraps. And I wanted to share one uh, story that a kid last Sunday when I was there shared with me. He, Gabriela, if you could put that oh, particular poster just, yeah. at the end there, fantastic. Perfect. 
Um, so a kid approached us while we were composting and looked at the food scraps that he was going to drop off, but then looked at our almost finished compost and was like, wait, is this the culmination or the foundation of our food? And for me, that was just a gratifying moment to see a kid kind of look at, at our food system holistically and understand that what he was bringing in would eventually be nur nurturing um, the food that he might be able to be eating in a few months. Um, so we, through this compost uh, committee, were able to, you know, educate the community, but we're also helping the city divert uh, food from its landfill. And I work for an environmental advocacy organization, and I know how hard the city's working through its 1NYC plan to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 80% 80 80 by 2050. So I think that it's great to see kind of a, um, a local approach to achieving those goals. Second, um, I wanted to share a more personal story and connection to this garden. I am from Puerto Rico, and I moved to the city seven years ago. And many of the things that I left fell in both the category of nature and community. And those are two things that I've found immediately when I got to Maple Street Community Garden. It's a, a place where we come together to solve problems, and that has brought us together to become a family. So I'm also very grateful to have that experience in, in a, such a big city like New York and also very far from my family. And you know, the other part is that I, I've become an active um, stewardship of my community. And with that, I finally get a chance to return to New York after it has given so much to me. So thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to express um, the ultimate gratitude to the organizers of Maple Street for their commitment to this cause. Um, we understand the value and commitment they have made and we want to make sure that we are uh, staunch advocates on proceeding ahead um, and we look forward to the day in court where this is uh, concluded favorably for uh, the Maple Street Garden. Thank you so much. At this time I'd like to call for any other speakers who have not signed a speaker's slip to come forward. If not, we will move forward with the calendar item number two. Calendar item number two, 170189ZRK and 170190ZMK. These applications submitted by Brownsville Linden Plaza LLC seek a zoning map amendment from an M1-1 district to an R7D and R7A district with a C2-04 overlay and a zoning text amendment to designate a mandatory inclusionary housing area on three blocks bounded by Hegman Avenue, New Lots Avenue, Mother Gaston Boulevard, and Powell Street in the Brownsville section of Brooklyn Community District 16. Such amendments would facilitate two mixed-use developments ranging from seven to 11 stories with 531 affordable residential units. 315 of these units will be for households own earning up to 60% area median income, AMI, and 216 units for households earning up to 80% AMI with a fraction of the units averaging to 60% AMI per the MIH program. Community Board 16 approved this application on April 25th, 2017. Would the representative for this application, Peter Procida? Yes. Excellent. <laughs> and Erica Keller, please state your names for the record and present the application. Hi, uh, thank you, uh, Deputy v Borough President. My name is Peter Procida, and I'm presenting on behalf of Ebenezer Plaza owner, Brownsville Linden Plaza. We're the development entity uh, for the project. Um, <laughs> uh, there we go. As you stated, this is the area in which the rezoning will occur. Uh, our two parcels are located on New Lots Avenue between Hegeman, between Powell and Christopher. Uh, the rezoning will will be a mix between R7A and R7D. Um, the, the site is currently uh, occupied by a number of vacant industrial buildings. Um, these buildings are set to be demolished beginning at some point in the next 30 to 60 days. Oh. 
Um, this slide shows a summary of the zoning that we are requesting. As was said, it was an R7A and R7D mix. The R7D extends from Hegeman Avenue on Block 3862, which is between Powell and Sackman, 150 feet, and on Block 3861, 100 feet uh, from Hegeman Avenue. And then we also, at the request of uh, Brooklyn Planning, were asked to um, rezone Block 3860, which is not under our control. Site A, which is Block 3862, again between Powell and Sackman, will be developed using uh, using the HPD, ELLA, and R-SPACE programs for 315 units. Uh, all of those units will be affordable to households under 80, or under 60 percent of AMI. Uh, site B, which will be 216 units, will be fit using the HPD, R-SPACE, and the HPD mix and, max, mix and match program. So 50 percent of the units will be available to households earn, earning under 60% of AMI and 50% of the units will be available to households earning under 80% of AMI. Uh, this is a zoning change map. Uh, our proposed development, as was stated, is a mix between, of buildings from seven to nine stories. Uh, here's a, a rendering in an aerial format. Um, our ground floor plan, we've partnered with the Church of God of East Flatbush, who will occupy a large portion of the uh, first phase on the ground floor. The first phase will also have approximately 10,000 square feet of retail. Uh, the second phase will have about 20,000 square feet of retail on the ground floor and open space for the tenants. The tenants of the first phase have open space uh, for their use on the roof of the, the church space. Uh, our unit mix is shown at the top. We have 47 studios, 318 one bedrooms, 79 two bedrooms, 85 three bedrooms, and two units for our live-in uh, supers. Um, and there's some information on the, the breakdowns that I just went through below. As I said, here's a, a typical floor plan for site A, which shows uh, the second floor, the, the community, or the the tenant outdoor space. Um, and we have a couple of more renderings. I, I think that concludes uh, my portion of the. Thank you very much. I wanted to just go through a few questions. Regarding the intended affordable housing units, what is the qualifying income range for prospective households based on household size? What are the anticipated rents based on the number of bedrooms? And what is the distribution of units by bedroom size? Okay. Also, in addition to how long are the non-MIH units required to be rented at affordable rates? So that uh, involves what would be the in perpetuity Mm -hmm. Question. Yeah, so the MIH units are in perpetuity. Uh, we have not yet negotiated our full regulatory agreement with HPD, but at a minimum, I believe there'll be about 60 years uh, of fully affordable uh, at those same AMI levels. Um, in regards to the mix, uh, in the first phase, um, approximately. 20% of the units are using the HPD R-Space program, which is referrals out of the shelter system. We have six studios, 37 one bedrooms, nine two bedrooms, and 10 three bedrooms in that program. Um, That's a total of how many units? 62. 62. Mm -hmm. uh, those rents are uh, set by HPD and they have not released the, the 2017 numbers yet, but they are less than these 30% numbers. I believe it's about 15% of AMI, so it's about half of the numbers that you can see at the top, which are the 2016 rentals. Uh, I know the monthly rent is a little bit more than half of that, but you know, they're, they're pretty low. Um, 
on the R space. For the, the other units, I do have exact data for 2017 that so I can share. Is this receiving supportive housing subsidy? Um, it is it is shelter rents. So shelter but, rents from the city, state, federal government? Can you go up? City, HPD. <laughs> Come up there. I know how hard you've worked on this. <laughs> and so, Erica, if you could state your name. Erica Keller, uh, Ebenezer Plaza owner member. And Erica, as far as the city subsidy, right? Yes. For what would be the homeless set aside. Yes. These are studios and one bedrooms. Well, there will be a homeless set aside throughout all of the unit mix. Okay. And there is a percentage that HPD has set. Mm -hmm. So a percentage of the studios, percentage of one bedroom, percentage of two bedrooms, percentage of three bedrooms are set aside for the R space program. The R space program is for formerly homeless um, and those are shelter rents, usually 27% AMI and below. And there are also supportive services provided for um, those tenants. On so, site. On site. So they will get a rent, there's a furniture subsidy provided mm -hmm. to them, as well as other um, services to help them transition out of the shelter into permanent housing. Will there be a social service component within the building to help support those families? Just the initial transitional um, transitional time period, so to say. There mm -hmm. isn't like an on-site case manager. There are referrals that are made mm -hmm. to um, those families for additional supports, and there's the initial trans transitional component where they would have a case manager to help them with the furniture allocation mm -hmm. and, and, and such. And is there any discussions that have continued regarding having case management on site? There hasn't been, that isn't necessarily a component, a, a, a consideration for this program. This program is really targeted for those in the shelter system that have been there for extent, you know, for a, a s circumstance and really need to transition into permanent housing. They really can be independent, but because whatever circumstance may have put them mm -hmm. into the shelter, they need that additional support to just mm -hmm. help them get back into permanent housing. And is this going to take into consideration what would be the population of formerly homeless working? Yes. So it's 27% AMI and below, but they do have to show that they have salary for each one of the caps. And so these are the formerly homeless working individuals? Yes. Plus families? Plus families. With income? With income. But and if they have incomes below or above those ranges? 27% and below below the ranges so that are identified on this screen here. But the, so the minimum incomes listed, if some from the shelter had income below that? They would qualify for the R space. qualify. For the R space program. So they would be get, you'd be getting an operating subsidy in essence? To support that, exactly. Because it can go all the way to like 10%, I yeah. believe, 10% AMI. So 10% 10, 10 mm -hmm. AMI. Yes. So if you're 10 to 27 or 30, you qualify for the program. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to repeat myself so that I have a clear understanding. It's fam formerly homeless families and individuals with an income yes. not limited to what would be uh, a salary, but in addition could be on public assistance? I believe so. I'm not 100% sure about the public assistance component, but there they are individuals with salary, and the salary cap for that is 27% AMI. So, so do you know if it's a fixed income salary or is it a working employment salary? So for the individual, I believe it's an employment salary. Mm -hmm. Then for the rental subsidy, it's a fixed cap on that mm -hmm. rent. Mm -hmm. rental subsidy, shelter mm -hmm. rent. Mm -hmm. and, and how long do they get to retain the gap financing on top of their income to afford the rent based on the 27% AMI rent? So I leading really to the question like is there, so for instance, if they had an increase in their salary, do they still qualify? I believe that there are adjustments made. It's not as if the person is no longer 
available or has to leave the apartment or, or something to that extent. So you're saying if they have an increase in their salary, are they still eligible? Well, to it won't no. be punitive. If, right. No, but no. if they don't raise their salary enough and they still need, whether it's a lesser version of that gap, could they have that gap seven years into the future? Is there an absolute cutoff date where they stop getting that gap and therefore they can't make their rent payment? So our understanding is the R space program is running concurrently with all the other programs that exist. As long so as, the, as the funding. As the funding source is available, exactly. And so these particular units, are they going to have community board preference of homeless shelters in Brownsville? So my understanding is that each one of the categories, there's a, has to be addressed in evenly in the distribution. So out of that 50% set aside for community board 16, it's going to be spread across all of the various other subcategories that are covered. Including the shelter the rents. The space program, yes. Uh, set aside. Set aside program, exactly. Fantastic. And given the community concerns regarding displacement and the prevalence of rent burdened households, please identify what marketing strategies such as designating one of these, one of a community, the community's affordable housing nonprofits as the affordable housing administrating agent will be used in the tenant selection process in order to ensure the highest level of participation from community board, community district 16. Uh, would such marketing strategies start off with a financially, financial literacy campaign to assist area residents, including and not limited to the homeless shelters in Community Board 16, to become lottery, lottery eligible? So, so we have a management company that has been identified to work with, and I think what, what makes this, this development even more unique is that we have identified an on-site location for the management company. So above and beyond the superintendent and the porter that are usually present from the team, there will be office and administrative staff there since it is such a large um, development. So the management company, you know, we're going to have to follow the guidelines as per um, HPD and HDC in reference to using the Housing Connect program mm -hmm. through the lottery system. Um, the management company will have to be versed in that program and follow all the rules and regulations um, as per HPD and HDC um, for fair housing um, opportunity. Um, and in, in it, within that, we also will have to follow the guidelines as per the preferences that have been identified for the community board for each one of the unit types, mm -hmm. as well as each one of the income levels. Um, we are fortunate enough as well in this development to also be working with um, the Church of God of H. Flashbush, which has a subsidiary not-for-profit organization, HOPE. Um, and they will are transitioning into the community, so they're bridging the East Flatbush community along with the Brownsville community, and they offer the, those services in East Flatbush and will continue to offer the services that you just spoke to in terms of literacy and, and financial literacy and how you can prepare yourself for the Housing Connect and a lottery program, and they will continue to provide those services in, the, in Brownsville as well. So we're gonna look to them to support that as well along with the management company because we do have to follow all the rules and regulations mm -hmm. as per HPD, HDC. And, and has the Church of God of Flatbush ex have experience in doing the marketing and uh, financial literacy campaign to prepare families? So not specifically for this endeavor, because mm -hmm. again, the, the, the organization is going to have to educate themselves as per right. the guidelines and the rules and regulations, but they have provided those supports in East Flatbush as part of their overall programming to support um, their their um, cons their parishioners mm -hmm. and and the community. So it's something that they're familiar with doing in a broad sense. And I think we can have them work with the management company so that on an informal level, they'll be able to speak to um, what the community will need in order to prepare themselves. Um, but again, we have to. I continuously emphasize that we'll have to follow all the all the guidelines. And as I, I appreciate that very much, Erica. Mm -hmm. I just you know in my days as a council member. I made sure that I had a year worth of preparation in financial literacy. 
monthly meetings with families, preparing them to qualify for affordable housing. Mm -hmm. And despite 10,000 applications for 87 units, you could go through 10,000 applications. And I have one person to have qualified, qualified exactly. individuals. And so this is that. an endeavor. And I just want to make sure that I don't underscore that and mm -hmm. that we are prepared to make sure that we maximize the opportunity here for what would be formerly homeless families and individuals in Brownsville and the efforts of what is working with the Church of God of Flatbush to be able to uh, provide um, information. tangible mm -hmm. information, tangible. Exactly. tangible opportunity, because one has to lead to the other. Without the other, it cannot be possible. And, and I think that's definitely something that we can work with the church on and targeting, as you're saying, even mm -hmm. now, before we even put shovel to ground, mm -hmm. um, those efforts so that when we get to the point where we are at marketing for phase mm -hmm. one, um, we will have members of the community that are aware and know and are prepared and will be eligible. I appreciate that very much. And so if people are interested in following up uh, via viewing what would be this hearing, um, at Brooklyn Borough President Adams' office, they could go to the Church of God of Flatbush to get further information. Church of God of East Flatbush. Of East Flatbush. And we will help prepare them um, to be able to answer those questions. And we know that Community Board 16 will also be very supportive mm -hmm. of that endeavor as well. Mm -hmm. And the unit mix favors studio and one-bedrooms apart, one-bedroom apartments. Um, Borough President Adams and I understand the need for senior housing. Um, family size affordable housing units are highest in demand. What consideration has been given to provide an affordable housing unit mix that favors two and three bedroom units and or prioritize seniors on fixed incomes for the smaller, very affordable units separate and aside from the 20% for formerly homeless? Uh, so for instance, Ella layered over what would be uh, the Sarah, rental Sarah program. shelter rent mm -hmm. right. so the we have explored um, we initially so the unit mix was kind of an outgrowth of input from the community board and the community um, where they requested specifically a reduction in the number of studios and an increase in one two and three bedrooms mm -hmm. as much as possible um, so that is what resulted in the unit mix that you see. We did mm -hmm. explore as an outgrowth of that conversation with the community, the possibility of merging term sheets with HPD where we're looking at an ELLA program in combination with the SAWA program. However, they just were not really. Yeah, they were not too receptive. To too receptive to that con concept of mixing to term sheets. Um, we explored the possibility of even having one building allocated. But again, then that starts to, because the SARA program triggers federal funding and there are fair housing market, there are fair housing marketing um, mandates that if we set it up that way, we're kind of an antithesis to what the federal mandates state in, in, in reference to fair market, ha fair market housing um, that would be open to everyone. Right. So we, we, we tried our best to explore that, knowing that what the data tells us um, and what the community was interested in. But again, you kind of have to layer that or measure that or the compromises between what are the federal, state, and other mandates that you have to follow. But even with the 27, percent and slightly higher AMI categories, you probably have a decent chance for seniors to be able to afford those units. Mm -hmm. And if you had more studio units, you could accommodate more seniors, whether it's seniors coming out of shelters or, again, community seniors that are in less stable living conditions. So I think it's something worth exploring. So again, the only issue there was the community board was right. adamant about the number of studios. Maybe it's a conversation we need to visit. Mm -hmm. it, the, but the one bedrooms, right? I mean, there's 365 studios and one bedrooms in total. That's right, significant. Total, it is significant. And you mean, you, you're telling me that it was a higher percentage of studios than one bedrooms, or just overall the 365 was even higher? It was higher. Well, right. So the 365 
um, there were less one bedrooms and there were more, more two, studios two, and more two bedrooms and more two bedrooms. But due to the community board's request of the the shift in the studios, in order to keep our unit count where it really needed to be for HPD, we had to lose some two bedrooms. Otherwise, we would, with the reduction that the studio of the reduction of studios that the community board requested, we would have ended up losing uh, in the neighborhood of 100 units across the whole project. But the demand in the community, considering the volume of shelters in Brownsville, in Community District 16, and I don't need to pontificate to HPD, on the demand of two bedroom and three bedrooms. It's a quality versus quantity game. You have mm -hmm. quantity of units. Do we have quality? That's what we need to find out. Mm -hmm. And I, I believe that the two and three bedroom calling upon this project on behalf of the community board is right on, right? Um, considering they know their landscape of how much shelters they're host to, three quarter homes they're host to, to understand that they need more volume of two and three bedrooms mm -hmm. um, and prefer less studios. So therefore, amongst the 365, which is a very healthy volume of studio and one bedrooms, mm -hmm. is it possible to be able to consider a layer of Ella, which, is, which can perhaps accommodate what is seniors on fixed income, social security, pensions, um, but not leave them out where they fall between categories of AMIs. Because what we're seeing is this phenomenon of seniors looking for housing and they're not counted in the homeless shelters because right. they're not going to the homeless shelters right. because what they're doing is renting a room, doubling up, tripling up in an apartment. They're not the millennium, they're in their golden years. Right, so I think the issue with that is, because again, the, the approach that we had, so when we had the conversation, again, with the community board and, and with HPD, the issue is the funding, right. right? So I don't know if there is, because Ella is contemplated for families, right. extremely low, low affordability. And so it's almost like you would have to target, I'm assuming the AMI that we're, we, the assumption are made or what the data tells us that the seniors are in order for them to qualify for those apartments. Mm -hmm. um, but then you're now creating a preference for a group. Well, you're not really doing a preference. You're just providing a stock that they could That they could for. access. You know, a one bedroom rent for a senior at 40% AMI may be beyond their means, but a studio at a 40% AMI may be rent they can afford. You know, if they're earning 60, 70, 80% AMI, they probably are in a pension with an ownership situation. Mm -hmm. They don't need the unit. Or maybe a one bedroom at a 27% AMI. Right. So I guess that's really a conversation that we have to have because the way in which we really approached it was more about blending. It's a great blend. I'm, right. I'm not disputing the blend. I am trying to capture a population that all too often gets, gets lost. missed. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so that's food for thought, and I know HPD is present, and I want to make sure that there's a understanding that we're closely monitoring, tracking, uh, what is the senior population on a fixed pensioned income that is not getting picked up on the lottery because it's not focused on, and we on do not population. have 202 funding coming from the federal government. government anymore. And not anytime soon, I'd imagine, unless there's a miracle from God. And so I am trying to share what is our perspective on the borough and being sensitive to the fact that we've created under the leadership of our mayor, Ella, and is it limited to families, or can it be expanded to layer a project like yours 
where an excellent blend has been achieved, can we just push a little further to layer with a population getting missed? I mean, I think that's definitely something that, that could be considered. When we were trying to come up with that same, mm -hmm. or address that same issue, mm -hmm we approached it in a different manner by mm -hmm. saying, is there a way to blend SARA program, the mm -hmm. senior affordability rental program with Ella, and you know the mixing of term sheets wasn't right. the way to go, but maybe a layering, as you're saying, would right. be a better approach. So I, I definitely think it is something that, that right. could be at least approached and explored. I appreciate it. And this site selection, or this site's location and size of the proposed retail space make it uh, a fresh program eligible. And when I was in the council, fresh was a brand new concept, right? Leveraging what would be uh, FAR capacity increases if you were to incre uh, include what would be access to fresh produce and vegetables, uh, commercial space to a development and incorporating neighborhood supermarket concept, mm -hmm. no less than 10,000 square feet. Can we, uh, can you tell us what steps did your application prepare in order to connect local nonprofits to available commercial ground floor space for community facility use as well as fresh opportunities? So we initially started with that. Yeah, so mm -hmm. we initially reached out to um, Bogopa or Food Bazaar about taking a large space and increasing the retail further on the ground floor to utilize the FRESH program. What we ended up realizing is that the FAR bonus, is, if the grocer is ever to leave, you lose your C of O on that additional FAR. Uh, so if the tenant backs out as an owner, you're sort of stuck with units that you can't have people in. Um, so we sort of, we backed away from that. Um, but, but we did, um, still we still are open to the concept of having a grocer uh, take some of the space. We, um, you know, there are, FA, there are fresh benefits to tenants. Uh, so as we get further along in the process and, you know, it becomes more of a real option for a tenant to look at the space, uh, you know, maybe we are going to continue speaking with grocers because the influx of 500 units across from you know, uh, it's a, little a, number, town. a number of single family homes, there, there's a lot of people that could be served. Um, in terms of nonprofits, we've reached out to a number, including um, Made in Brownsville and Melting Pot. Made in Brownsville is a local arts organization who we've spoken about, about possibly taking some space in the second phase. And Melting Pot is an organization that uh, is working to uh, increase food, I guess. Entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship. They've opened a, a uh, They've helped the three sisters open a, a cafe in Brownsville called Three Black, Black Cats. Cats. Mm -hmm. um, I'm familiar. Lady Fergie came by. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So we've reached out to them in order to uh, see if there's some sort of partnership we can come to mm -hmm. uh, where they can take some space on the ground floor and really help, you know, activate the street and, and provide. Is that support. for an expansion or? I think it's other entrepreneurs. Other entrepreneurs. Okay. Other entrepreneurs that would start their yeah. business in the space. Good. And just going back to the supermarket piece, the food bazaar conversations, are they still active? So we would, what we found was that moving forward with the FRESH program, there were risks involved in reference to getting the FAR tied to um, that particular usage for a vendor. However, every step along the way, we know that Brownsville is underserved in reference to fresh food markets and um, grocers, and so every step of the way, we've heard that that's really the only thing that makes sense, at least on one of the commercial mm -hmm. uses. You have, you know, families, 531 families coming in this location. There's another 130 families coming just two blocks away. Mm -hmm. So we will continue. It's a little difficult to market it now. Um, we've reached out to brokers who have made some outreach, but, you know, we're still in this phase of the development, mm -hmm. so it's difficult to get the interest, I think, as we begin to advance. And Trader Joe's? We would love to. We, you know. <laughs> I just want to share a story, Erica, with the public. Um, when I represented Williamsburg and Bushwick, I was trying to get Trader Joe's before Trader Joe's came to Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, they weren't in Queens, they weren't in Staten Island. They were nowhere other than 14th Street Union Square. And I had an economic development study funded to look into what would be opportunities of economic development. And one of them was having uh, what would be alternative fresh produce and vegetable, uh, more than 10,000 square feet of space. Um, Trader Joe's was one of those individual companies that I met with here in Borough Hall as a council member, and they explored what would be entertaining the opportunity, but said they didn't want to be uh, the first in any one neighborhood, but uh, they wanted to see the demographics. They soon, a year later, after that conversation, opened up in the Woodhaven Forest Hills area on Metropolitan Avenue, smaller square footage of what we were offering in our neighborhood, um, in addition to what would be opening downtown Brooklyn, where there's not a food desert. And so I hope that food uh, establishments hear and view the YouTube channel of the borough president to hear loud and clear, um, Brooklyn is open for business, whether it has the demographics you want to see or not in every neighborhood. And that is a message loud and clear that we have been trying to transpire. Um, and I hope that we can see the day where demographics are not the driving force. Uh, these communities are paying twice, if not triple, the amount of money on fixed incomes for fresh produce and vegetables at a bodega, 24-hour access. And there's another store along the Trader Joe's model. At one point, they were more affiliated, uh, I guess the German sister of it. Uh, one store has come into Brooklyn. I'm forgetting the name of it. Aldi's. but it, Yeah, mm -hmm. on Nostrand Avenue, mm -hmm. right? They came into Brooklyn and Sheepshead Bay. So that may also, it's a little more no frills than Trader Joe's, but that may be another company. They to look for that to. size. And they're cl clearly less concerned with some of the demographics in terms of the overall dollars because there's a lot of public housing sheep and no strands right over there. So they've gone in and that's a company you may want to reach out to as well. Definitely. And they I need mean, to be directly solicited to come to you. And okay. that may not be enough. So I just wanted to make sure that uh, we know. make ourselves available for those discussions. We want to see uh, the access at uh, these particular neighborhoods where there are food deserts, um, and we know that you can take advantage of the FRESH program. I understand uh, that if the FRESH commercial space uh, with a company with the FAR, if not occupied in that commercial space, if the supermarket were to leave, that the units would become vacant. Um, that is an option also not to use the FAR mm -hmm. and just concentrate on getting the financial incentive plus the space to accommodate that food That's desert food issue. Exactly. That is something that we, we're mm -hmm. still exploring with uh, you know, commercial grocery tenants. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And as part of the Borough President's uh, Cross Brooklyn Initiative, connecting residents on safer streets, the Borough President believes that making street crossing safer for children and seniors would be a priority. The project area's location where Linden Boulevard traffic merges onto Hegman Avenue within close proximity of the New Lot Station and directly across the street from the Brownsville Recreational Center provides an opportunity to improve street safety by introducing a variety of traffic coming mechanisms. And if you could just go back. You want to go to the aerial The beautiful, yes. What steps? Is the applicant prepared to take to coordinate with DOT to address pedestrian safety along Hageman Avenue between Linden Boulevard and Mother Gaston Boulevard? As you can see from that aerial view, the addition of 500 more units and the population concentrated to cross, making this uh, not uh, the, the safest of yes. environments. No, uh, I spend a lot of time out there, and it is can you use the mic. Sorry. I spend a lot of time out there, and it's certainly a dangerous intersection. Um, people come off Linden Boulevard going upwards of 80 miles an hour. Um, we're happy to work with the borough president's office and DOT in any way in which we can help uh, to try and you know, safen that intersection up. 
Have you conducted a, a traffic study consultant on traffic we have, study mitigation uh, recommendations? Yes, we conducted a, a traffic study as a part of our EAS, um, and there was no impact uh, implicated. Do you recall if there are any mitigation recommendations? There were not, no. Hmm. Who did you use as your consultant? Uh, Equity Environmental. And they, they did not see any mitigation, future mitigations? Off the top of my head, uh, I, I do not remember that section uh, completely, but there was a no impact uh, issued from DCP on the traffic. If you can just go back to them. Of course. I would appreciate that very much. Thank you. Um, maybe this particular picture may help them recall what safety looks like. And they can perhaps recommend what would be items that we can start to discuss with DOT, okay. anticipating a growth in population and use of crossing these particular streets and intersections. It is Borough President Adams' policy to promote the use of sustainable renewable energy resources focused on advancing a sustainable future in Brooklyn. We are also looking to promote practices to retain stormwater runoff. What consideration has been given possibly in cooperation with the Department of Environmental Protection, the Mayor's Office of Sustainability, NYSERDA, as well as NIPA, towards incorporating passive house design solar panels, wind turbines, blue and green, blue or green or white, roof covering, permeable pavers and or bioswells, to name a few. So uh, in regards to- Again, if you could step sorry. closer to Mike. Where are you going, I think. Yeah. Oh. Not coming out, okay. There we go. So in regards to the roofs, we are doing white roofs across the entire building. Uh, we did do a solar study, but again, the, the best place for solar is on the southern roofs, and the way that our southern roofs are laid out, it's not really economical from the solar consultant's perspective to put solar panels on the roof. They did not think it made a ton of sense uh, from an ownership standpoint to incorporate that, just from the way that how much it would cost in order to put up the systems and how large the systems would be, the return was not really going to be significant. Um, because of the design? Because of uh, the way that the setbacks <coughs> are, are done, the, because of the way the setbacks are done, the portion of the roof that is tallest is very narrow and it does not uh, line up well for solar panels for whatever reason that is. Was, yeah. Was, so it, I think some of it just really was about the natural orientation of the buildings and like the rising of the sun and, and that study that was done. So we could incorporate it. They did, you know, we looked at if we were to have solar panels, what is the impact? Because we don't want to just have them there just to say we have them. Are they really? affecting the building in a positive way in reference to energy usage. And the study um, findings were that even when we put them there, there would not be a substantive impact in terms of the energy usage for the building. So let me just understand this because I'm trying to understand, is it because of the positioning of the buildings, which then means that the architect was not a passive house pa certified architect, taking the principle of passive that incorporates what would be solar panel but not limited to solar panel to then say that the taller building has to be behind so that it doesn't cast a shadow. It, the, the way the buildings were laid out actually ended up being a result of the zoning uh, which was sort of recommended from planning and that drove the design uh, in a way because the solar study was one of the first things we did. Wow. Um, so we, we kind of looked at a number of configurations so before once again, even designing the building. City planning is telling you that this is the best design to incorporate and position buildings to get volume of units. N no, mm. really uh, the, the design or the, the ask for the rezone um, first came out of the council member. She had a concern about height.
Mm -hmm. There's a number of um, Nehemiah homes mm -hmm. that are just across the street. Mm -hmm. So there was a concern about what would the impact be on, on those homes if we had very tall buildings. So the emphasis was to have the density that would be needed because of course, you know, she wants affordable housing in her district, but there was a concern on how to measure that or, or tap that down to make sure that the height did not exceed. So there were a number of combinations that were created to cause the perfect scenario, so to say, where we were Capture. able to get the density, but yet remain at heights that were acceptable. Mm -hmm. um, and then the shadow study was done. The shadow study was done to support that we were minimizing impact on the Nehemiah homes as well as the community garden on New Lots Avenue. Mm. So we have sort of like, you know, a seven, nine, 11 combination happening with setbacks mm -hmm. and um, with the solar panels and the way in which the sun rises and sets, it just didn't become a feasible um, solution to yield what we would expect it to yield. And beyond solar panels, what other, you mentioned white roof covering. Yeah, and we are doing stormwater detention uh, in the buildings. Uh, the landscaped areas, areas will have porous pavers mm -hmm. and, and other sustainable techniques. Uh, we are in the process of finding a, a landscape architect to help work on those, uh, the exact plans for that, mm -hmm. but we are you know, intending to be a sustainable and um, you know, sustainable is great for everybody. It helps bring down the operational costs of the building, increases the, the, the longevity of the building uh, from you know, an ownership perspective. So it's something that we've been thinking about throughout the process of how to you know, give back to the community in terms of building it green we are building enterprise green communities above and beyond the required limits. Mm -hmm. So we scored pretty well on that. Uh, so, and, and it's something that's at the forefront of sort of a number of decisions that we are making. And Passive House was not included in this project. We are not designing to a Passive House standard. Um, the, it just did not, uh, we, we did look at it, but the viability of it didn't seem to, to be feasible to, to work given the, the increased construction costs due to passive house. And, and what was the difference? The, di the dollar difference in non passive house versus passive house? I'd have to get back to you on that. Yet, Erica, the last project you came to us last month is with passive house. Yes. And given that this is a two phase project, is there a window of opportunity, if not in the first, perhaps still on the second? That, that is certainly that. something that we could look we could at as the second phase okay. could be designed to a passive house standard. And that's a great comparison study. Between the two buildings, mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. So we would like to highly recommend that, that as that. part of the future uh, considerations. Um, what type of public funding has the council member given? Okay. I'm just... If we could continue the conversations on phase two okay. of this development um, as, as passive house, that would be very helpful as we continue uh, budget cycles. Okay. And, and given the height of the building, again, uh, if you look at the smaller wind turbines, you know, we have examples right off the screen in Borough Hall, it's a building that has two small turbines up there if you look. And so if it's worth, again, exploring the possibility of whether that's feasible. Yeah, we can reach out to our engineering team and uh, environmental team and see if that's something that makes sense. And as far as uh, the policy to maximize, maximize good quality jobs for Brooklyn Knights, can you please outline what steps would be taken to ensure the inclusion of, and participation of minority and women-owned business enterprises and local business enterprises in the process of construction on this site? So we are looking to work with um, several not-for-profit organizations to support the hiring of local as well as minority and women business enterprises. 
Um, we also are going to have to work through the New York City Hire Program now, which has a mandated participation of 30% of local um, minority and women business enterprise in all um, projects funded by the New York City um, Housing Authority, any of the housing agencies. We're targeting really 50%. We've started that outreach and the conversations with a number of local organizations, um, the New York State Association of a Minority, the New York State Chapter of the mm -hmm. National Association of Minority Contractors, as well as Man Up and other organizations in the community. Mm -hmm. We've already begun those conversations. So we are going to enter into a formal agreement with those entities in order to support us with local hiring, OSHA training, um, and also the solicitation of um, subcontractors that cover the various um, trades. And uh, our demolition, which I said was slated to begin in the next few months, uh, is being done by a Brooklyn-based minority uh, and veteran. Excellent. Veteran-owned business. Excellent. Veterans was my other category, so I appreciate you mentioning it before I did. Um, we just want to make sure that we are uh, increasing contracting opportunities for all sectors um, and making sure that there's a monitoring agent mm -hmm. associated to this development um, and every development that comes before us to ensure um, opportunity. Thank you very much uh, to both of you. Thank you. Thank I'd you. like to, absolutely, this is a very well thought out uh, project. We look forward to seeing the evolution um, and future conversations uh, to continue uh, to make this project uh, a very exemplary one. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to call for any other speakers who have not signed to come up. Seeing none, we will move into the next item. Calendar item number 3170304HAK. The application submitted by the New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development, HPD, seeks Urban Development Action Area Project, UDAP, designation and project approval and disposition of private and city-owned land in the Bedford-Stuyvesant neighborhood of Brooklyn Community District 3. Such actions would facilitate the development of an 11-story mixed-use building creating 71,417 square feet of residential floor area and 13,236 square feet of commercial retail floor area. The development will create 96 affordable housing units with 19 permanently set aside for households earning up to 80% area median income, AMI, pursuant to the Voluntary Inclusionary Housing Program. Community Board 3 approved this application on May 1st, 2017. Would the representatives for this application, Dan Moran, please state your name for the record and present the application and your associates. Good evening, my name is Dan Moran. I'm a planner with the uh, Brooklyn Planning Unit of the Department of Housing, Preservation and Development. I'm joined here by representatives from SMJ and BFC, um, our development partners, and also from Shakespeare Gordon Vlado, our architect for the project. So we will be talking about 1618 Fulton tonight. Um, it is a project in CB3, which is uh, Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn, on the south side of Atlantic. I'm sorry, on the south side of Fulton. Uh, let's see if my, I'm not sure if the click or the pointer works, but. Yeah, I'm trying to use the laser, but it's not working. Um, so it's right in the center. OK, but I wanted the pointer. The, that's okay. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, so it's right in the center of that um, large map. Uh, it's outlined in red. Uh, it is a, uh, let's see, what's the square footage? Uh, 14,000 square feet. Um, the total development site. <clears throat> The city is contributing three lots to the development, the three that are shaded dark gray. Um, the addresses are 1616, 1624 Fulton, and 20R Troy Avenue. And actually, 20R Troy Avenue is 
uh, is the site that's horizontal in the center of the block and has no street access. So, um, can you is, repeat those addresses? Tara? Sure. The, the the one on the left, which is the west, uh, the the dark gray, is uh, 1616 Fulton. The um, the one that that touches the street to the east is 1624 Fulton, and the horizontal uh, kind of landlocked lot is. 20R Troy Avenue. They're all on block 1699. So those are the three sites that HPD is seeking disposition approval for. Um, as Deputy Borough President Reyna stated, the, the proposed project is an 11-story, 96-unit, 100% uh, affordable, but also mixed income uh, project with 13,000 square feet of ground floor retail. Just to, uh, and just to also highlight the, the fact that those three HPD lots in dark gray are um, rather difficult to develop alone and have very limited uh, kind of unit generating potential. Um, we estimate that since only two of those lots of street frontage, we could produce maybe 10 units at the most um, across the two uh, across the, the city-owned sites, but combined with five uh, private lots, which are the ones in the middle, and also to the west slightly, we can, uh, we're, we're gaining about, uh, we're producing about 96 units on the total development site. I'm trying to advance this. Can you just move me a slide forward? Oh, here we go. Um, so our actions are UDAP and Disposition. UDAP is, stands for Urban Development Action Area Projects and Program. Uh, it's essentially the city's authority to dispose of publicly owned land to a private entity. Um, and what we're ultimately trying to do is uh, convey the city, the three city owned parcels to BFC and, um, and SMJ for the construction of this, of this site of this project. Uh, this is, these are some photos of the street. Um, adjacent to the lot are, is uh, the, the parking lot for the Lawrence Woodward Funeral Home, which occupies the corner and the end of the, of the block. SMJ and BFC own five lots that are, they're contributing. One of the lots contains a vacant one-story laundromat building, which will be demolished, and another lot contains a three-story brick building that's also vacant and is slated for demolition for this project. And those are pictured in the, in the two photos on the right. Uh, on the street, down a little farther to the west, is our two uh, large 10-story or so housing developments, the Garvey and the Bradford. And across the street is, are the Risley Dent Towers, also uh, a 250 approximately unit affordable housing development with about seven stories high. And I'm going to pass it off to SMJ and BFC to present the project that they're proposing on these sites, and uh, also the architects. Um, my name is Juan Barahona, principal of SMJ Development. It's great to be here, Madam Deputy, along with Richard and Olga. It's, um, it's, uh, this has been the culmination of about uh, you know, years and a year and a half worth of effort in terms of assembling the site. Um, started with really with, a, with an idea uh, to take uh, what I had come across, which was a, a, a very odd broker's listing that was offering, um, you know, the, the laundromat site coupled with the HPD sites. Um, so I think that kind of spark, sparked my curiosity um, and led me to, to this point. Um, so, you know, like, like Dan stated, we are basically uh, taking three city-owned lots, which I, think, which I think otherwise on their own would probably be um, pretty, uh, pretty, you know, almost nominally useless, um, and have been able to combine them with five privately-owned lots to, to, to deliver, I, th I think, which is what we think is going to be a great project, an 11-story building with 96 apartments, uh, a mixed-income building, um, you know, down the block from a low-income building and another mixed-income building, and also like an 80-20 down. Um, and with Risley Dent, it's just a full uh, project-based Section 8 right across the street. So, and really kind of filling in what was really, uh, what, what if, you, if you're familiar with the site now, is kind of a very, um, you know, has a very hodgepodge-looking uh, site. Um, and to, uh, you know, to kind of yield, you know, carve out uh, and the end of this block and, you know, deliver something, which, which we're very proud of. So I don't want to, I mean, I want to, 
kind of like let the architect talk about the, the design, because I think they speak to, to that piece of it best, or at least better than I could. Um, and then, you know, come back and try to, you know, address any other, you know, more the pro programmatic questions that you might have. So I'd like to introduce uh, Shakespeare, Gordon, and Vlado. Um, Mark Gordon is one of the partners here. And, uh, Thank you. Uh, my name is Mark Gordon. I'm a partner with Shakespeare, Gordon, Vlado Architects, and I'm very pleased to be here. Um, very happy and proud to be involved in the making of affordable housing uh, in the city of New York. Um, so this is an exciting project for us, and we're, we're very uh, happy to be involved. Um, I will ask my uh, project architect, Ashima Chitre, to join me momentarily to talk about some of the details. But uh, just to give the brief overview of the design challenge, uh, what we have done is we've taken um, the, uh, the program that is required to make this project a success and, and try to give it um, an appropriate and dignified architectural form. Uh, and that's been done chiefly by, by volumetrically on the outside, taking the existing, uh, the, the, the actual volume of the building and allowing the material choices that we're, we're using to help to both uh, give it a little bit of uh, more human scale um, by breaking the volumes in, in, in their cladding and at the same time recognizing that the, the way in which the building is detailed needs to have some relationship to the existing and really diverse and exciting architecture of the neighborhood. So we've proposed a masonry vocabulary where we're using two uh, types of brick cladding, um, a, a darker, uh, kind of more, uh, call it somber brick color on the front of the building that faces the street and gives it kind of a dignified uh, civic presence and then a lighter brick color that wraps around on the other sides. Um, and we think that also helps to kind of give the impression, uh, sli slightly lessen the impression of bulk on the building by breaking it into these two volumes and, ex and expressing those volumes. Um, additionally, we are looking at ways of, of allowing the detailing of the fenestration to be uh, a little bit more rich than you might um, imagine in a, in a building of this type uh, by in increasing the depth so that the windows uh, cast shadows and there's a little level of architectural interest. You'll notice we also have a window, row of windows on the lot facing side, which is uh, I think an acknowledgement that while ultimately that could be built, we think that in the foreseeable future that's uh, a very visible and prominent part of the building. And so rather than treating this as a kind of a, a facade building with, with just blank walls, um, we're trying to give the building a little bit more three-dimensionality. So I guess uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Ashima to talk about the, uh, the units and the, and the plan layout. Thank you, Mark. Uh, my name is Ashima Chitre. I'm an associate at Shakespeare Gordon Vlado Architects. And I'm just gonna walk you through our plans very quickly. This is just an overview of the site plan that um, we've got over a couple of times. Um, so starting with our cellar level, we have a, a limited cellar plan. We're not um, excavating the whole lot, but we are essentially the important parts of the cellar. We're providing a children's playroom, a gym, and plenty of bike storage. So we are adhering to um, active design guidelines um, and hoping to uh, promote uh, activity and healthy living um, in, in this building. So up one level, this is our uh, first floor level where we have about um, 13,000 square feet of commercial retail uh, split into two and in the middle is our residential entry. Um, we also uh, purposely designed the residential entry to include an open stair so that um, residents right when they enter the building will see this as an opportunity to take the stairs rather than take the elevator, um, hopefully at least for the first few levels. So that too, um, we're incorporating many of the active design guideline elements. Um, then this is our, our second floor plan, which includes a roof terrace over 
uh, the rear part of the site, and then the remaining uh, front part um, is covered with units. So you will see as part of the terrace, um, we want to make it open for all residents, but also the units that face the terrace have their own uh, private terraces. Um, part of this thought was that um, these units are all designed to also be uh, suitable for mobility impaired residents so that they too can um, easily access outdoor space. So once again, we are promoting um, active design um, and healthy living as part of, as part of this project. Um, then moving up, uh, an alternate floor plan um, and then finally our setback, oop, no, our setback level, um, which again set back 10 feet and then the units along the front of the building also have an opportunity to have um, private terraces uh, along there. Um, on each floor you will see we've provided a laundry room so that residents have um, convenient access to laundry. And uh, you'll also see at the elevator lobby and the stairs, we've provided very large windows um, that will bring in lots of natural light and once again promote uh, the use of stairs and um, create a light-filled common area. So moving on, whoops. So this is our typical, some of our typical unit layouts. Um, some typical studios, our mobility impaired studios, as well as one bedrooms, and then our, our typical type B one bedrooms. Um, oops. Um, and then our typical two bedrooms and three bedroom units. Um, I'll hand it up back to Mark, thank you. And so here we just have the elevations, uh, just to give you a sense again of how we are treating the two volumes that that comprise the building, and uh, as it's uh, you know as a one building, the um, we've tried to also introduce uh, a little bit of whimsy and a little color into the facade uh, in a way that um, suggests that while it is a building that is intended to be timeless and important, it is also fair to say that it's okay to have uh, a bit of modern design even if you are using uh, what we'll call traditional materials. Uh, and I'm not sure how to, oops, sorry. Uh, these are just the, the side elevations of the building. Um, excuse me. And, and again, uh, to my earlier point, uh, we are recognizing that the, seat, the building really will be seen as a three-dimensional object, and so we're designing for the fact that you'll see two sides of it and, and recognizing that it needs to have a, a uh, sculptural uh, element to it and not just a facade. This is the rear facade. Um, a notable feature about this is the amount of glass. We're trying to balance the right uh, basically maximize the amount of glass that, that we can in order to bring light and daylight and I think the sense of activating the, the rear of the building, the, the facade that looks out onto the rear gardens um, with the energy performance that, that is required. So of course we have a limit on how big those, uh, those windows can be without uh, uh, essentially um, limiting our, our energy performance. Notice the large windows that are at the corridor, uh, the elevator lobbies, that's intended to allow those spaces to be light filled. We can minimize the amount of um, uh, artificial lighting that we have to provide there and it also just makes them nicer places to wait for the elevator. Seemed like a good thing to do. Uh, let's see, this is just a, a uh, rendering of what the building will be like at the street level. Uh, we have, of course, street level um, commercial spaces all along, except for where the uh, entry is, is indicated with a, a colorful uh, awning. We have uh, some additional lighting that we're providing so that, you know, this, this will feel um, inviting and safe to walk by. Um, 
and again, you can see we're trying to ensure that the facade and the materiality has a sense of richness and detail that um, hopefully recalls some of the, uh, the architectural uh, grandeur of an earlier era in that, in that neighborhood. I think that's it. Is that it? Okay. And you made I will turn it back to you. Board 9 very happy that you did the full setback instead of taking advantage of the dormer provision. I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over to Juan. Thank you, Richard. That's a great way to start. Right. <laughs> so, um, you know, just uh, in terms of, you know, the, uh, the meat of the project, the affordability, it's, um, it's HPD's and HTC's mixed middle uh, program, which is a combination of income tiers. You know, we have about 45%. So a little less than half of the project is at 130% AMI, which is you know, the, uh, the, the city's current highest max AMI. We did actually, uh, as a result of you know, a visit we had with you a few months ago, we, uh, we took our moderate income tier and split it up between 80 and 100% AMI. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you, know, you, have that, you have that breakdown in your package. And then the, the, low, in, the low income tier is at 60% AMI, um, which is a quarter of the apartments. As stated earlier, this is um, an inclusionary housing designated area, so in order to get the FAR bump, we are you know, required to do 20% of our apartments, our residential floor area rather, as permanently affordable, um, which, is, you know, which is a no-brainer, um, and we're happy to do. Um, and those units will be regulated in perpetuity as long as the, 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 bone, the building stands. In terms of affordability, I mean, we'll, you know, I think we're probably gonna you know, start with HPD at 35 years on the regulatory agreement for the balance of the units. Um, you know, and they will probably push more, and I'm inclined to probably, you know, agree to that. I know. So that's, you know, that's the, the project in a nutshell. The, in terms of the process, I mean, we've, um, we've been engaged with the community board for, you know, for about um, over a year. I think we visited the board, the land use committee, four times uh, to really, you know, try to really actively engage with, uh, with, the, with the land use committee. And I think, um, you know, I think uh, the fact that we, you know, it was, you know, but for one nay vote, we would have had a unanimous vote support the other day. I think that's a testament to, to the work that we did with the community board in terms of fashioning a, a, a project that they, that they felt that they could, you know, really get behind. Um, as well as, you know, work with, a, with Council Member Carnegie's office, um, you know, your office. Um, and, lo you know, and some local stakeholders, I mean, uh, just so you know, uh, Bridge Street Development Corp is going to be doing the marketing for us, mm -hmm. and so they're, we're very excited to, to partner well, with them. You're ahead of my questions here, you know? Okay. I don't know. Um, I mean, I don't know. I must be, uh, I must be a mind reader. You, you must be. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so, going to interrupt you because I don't want you to take away the line of questioning here. Sure. Um, so sure. I appreciate the presentation. Mm -hmm. um, I do want to just comment. I've never heard affordable housing facades being described as somber. Yeah. I want to just... I don't know, know if it's somber. Right, well, I think you know, I, I, it quickly just triggered... I, I meant dignified. Okay, oh, <laughs> I appreciate dignified more so than somber. Right. Um, I want to just make sure the emphasis of what is the Bedford-Stuyvesant community and understanding, you know, our depth of research and working with families in Bedford-Stuyvesant out of Borough Hall and recognizing that there's property owners who are elders, land rich, income poor, and the distribution of the AMIs starting at 60% to 130% um, doesn't lend to uh, what would be the possibilities of perhaps seniors who would want to qualify um, to be able to reach an opportunity for uh, this particular development. Do, is that something that came up in discussions at all with the community board? Not, not really. I mean, we, you know, we spent a lot of time on, um, you know, on really on, on the architecture, um, and you know, and, and understanding really the what was driving the AMI mix, and you know, 
the fact that you know the project is 60 percent private land that mm -hmm. was acquired at a market rate price you know kind of you know it was the main driver of, of the unit mix that you see in front of you you know mm -hmm. yes and i think hpd you know to their credit did a good job of leveraging as much affordability as, as possible out of their 40 percent contribution into the site i think they you know i mean technically it's 100 percent you know regulated you know i understand that different people have different views on what constitutes affordable however you know i think from the from the city's perspective you know they you know uh and not that I would have gone in and said I want to do, you know, a 50-50, you know, but I think, uh, you know, I think that would have been a non-starter with them anyway. So I think they, we always kind of, we worked from the premise that it had to be all affordable and we just had to try to find a way to, 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 to get a program that worked with, 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 a, with all these, with these various land prices. But, but the 130%, we all know, can go up to what would be all, possibly a 160 percent of it. Correct, yeah, in terms of the marketing, yeah, the, and the, so the agencies therefore, allow you that. This particular project can support what would be a lower income bracket from 60 percent as a category. Yeah, oh, so I'm sorry, so you're losing me. So oh. for example, if you had instead of 130 as a top rent, if you had say 145, because that still lets to 165, that Increased rent could let you do something oh, at a lower level. I mean, I think, uh, yes, yes, I mean, yes, but I would have to get HPD to buy into that piece. I'd I have wouldn't to get see HPD how they so wouldn't, to try. To, considering to <laughs> they have land that they're putting into this, mm -hmm. right? Um, no, well, I would have to, but I would have to, you're saying I would have to increase the rents to the 145 no, to drive down some of the other rents? If, if you had some of the 130 rented at, say, 145, you could take that money and now reduce rent collection at another part of your project mm -hmm. so you could hit more tiers. You know, great, you've expanded a tier, as you said, mm -hmm. but you could hit more tiers that way. I mean, look, I'm, I'm always game to, to work on it with them. You know, I don't, I don't ever say no. I, it's the blended know. model. It's a blended model. One that we're trying to really capture here, mm -hmm. where it's taking categories of individuals and families that are falling off the cuff. Mm -hmm. The bracket is so refined. Um, I saw it in my own experience as far as Williamsburg Greenpoint was concerned. Families earning a dollar more, a thousand dollars more were not qualifying. And it went into an open market. Mm -hmm. I, I, hear you. I, I hear what you're saying. It's an injustice to any community that becomes host to co supposedly affordable housing. Okay. And so we want to make sure that that does not become the impediment of qualifying for affordable housing. And so we have to be forward thinking and apply the tools necessary from learned mistakes of the past. HPD is very familiar with those mistakes. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I could, I, I'm more than happy to go back to uh, the, you know, the, the planners and the development staff and try to tweak this somehow to get, uh, to serve, you know, to, to, to make sure that people aren't just shy of what you know what they what they would otherwise qualify for i mean i think we're also i mean i'm also interested in you know i mean not it, it it'll make a small dent in you know applying for some project-based vouchers i'm talking about this tenant-based vouchers that could go to you know serving maybe some seniors in the building on you know um you know if we go to the, the max eight you know that doesn't that doesn't really impact the project at all but it does open up eight apartments to, you know, people mm -hmm. that are on mm -hmm. severely limited incomes. So I think that's, you know, that's an opportunity that we'll, we're definitely looking to explore uh, with the agency. And what about Ella? The, Ella wasn't applied here. No, this is M, M2. Mm -hmm. So this is, so it's still a bond deal. It's mm -hmm. still a bond deal with subsidy, mm -hmm. but it just, it, it, it allows for the higher income tiers, mm -hmm. right? So there's a, there's a small portion of low, like the tax credit housing here. Mm -hmm. And you're not permitted to use Ella because Correct. Yeah, I mean, it would, it's just one or the other, right? I and could, I mean, we, you know, I would have to, like, look at it at a complete, in a completely different way to see if an ELLA could work. ELLAs don't traditionally work when you have a, a land, substantial land acquisition, you know, because it's, it's hard to offset that, that cost. But you have city-owned lots. Correct, yeah. That are part of this, that are part which of that, is significant. Could, mm -hmm. So that's what I'm saying. I'm, I'm, we, we haven't looked at it. We could look at it. You know, I mean, through all the various iterations, 
Uh, you know, the, M the M2 program was the one that worked best, and frankly, before November 8th, you know, it really worked great, you know, and I think, yeah, unfortunately, a lot of Ellas are now suffering from, you know, this lack, this uncertainty created by the administration with respect to the low income housing tax credit program. So I think, you know, that fortunately we didn't feel that much of a dent here because mm -hmm. there's only a small portion of this tax credit housing. Um, but, you know, that's, you know, and also an interest rates are rising. So we're trying mm -hmm. to, you know, you know, keep all the balls up in the air. Mm -hmm. And what is the qualifying income range for prospective tenants based on household size and what are the anticipated rents based on the number of bedrooms in addition to how long are the units required to be rented at affordable rates? Okay. So I think the best way for me to answer that question is just to point you in this, because we have four income tiers, right? And then, you know, with different apartments, they, so we have the different income tiers, right? We could just share the, them out loud, because I know okay. we see them, but I okay. want viewers to understand. Okay, so we have, so 25% of the apartments are um, at 60% AMI, right? And so those rents, so studio rents for 736 a month, right? Um, and that, you know, would probably, you can only, I think you only have a one person household in there, and the maximum income is 32,000 a year, right? A one bedroom is 927 a month, and the maximum income there, I think, uh, I think you are allowed two people in there, but that's 40,000 a month. Uh, two bedrooms are 1121, and that's a maximum income of, you know, a little shy of 49,000, and that, I think, permits a three bedroom household, or maybe four if they're two small children. Um, three bedrooms are renting for 1289 and then the maximum income there is 56000 a year. You know, and I think that permits between five and six household members. Um, moving to the next, the moderate income tier at 80% AMI, it's $1,000 a, a month for the studio with a $54,000 max. And one bedroom is 1359 with a 67000 a little shy of 68,000 maximum income. The twos are 1,600 with a max of 81,000. The threes are 1,884 with a max of 94,000. The next income tier, of which there are 10 apartments, are the, the studios are at 1,320 for a max of 70,000. The ones are 1,658 for a max of 88,000. The twos are 1998 for combined max of 106,000, and the threes are 2,300 a month for a max of 122,000. And then our final tier, our highest income tier, the, uh, the studios rent for 1728, um, and you can't make more than 89,000. The ones rent for 2,100 a month, and you can't make more than 112. The twos rent for 2,600 a month, you can't make more than 134. And the threes rent for 3,000. You can't rent for 100, more than 100, I'm sorry, you can't make more than 155. And those numbers are based on 165,000, 165% AMI, those maximums? Or are they on a lower number? I mean, is it 165? That's the 165 max. Mm -hmm. So that's the, that's, so yeah, so if a 130 can be rented, like you said. And the same is true going up the column. I, I, I hear you. I, 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 see, I see your point. I think you know, it's, you know, it's really a matter of sharpening your pencil and working with the agencies to figure out how to, how to do also, it. And also, those at 130% AMI, they're paying 30% of the rent. If I'm at 165% AMI, I'm only paying about 20% of my Correct. rent. Mm -hmm. So those households, in theory, can be able to ask for something closer to the 30%. Mm -hmm. OK. I see what you're saying. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I can commit to going back to the agency and trying to figure out, you know, really kind of how we can do a little better to try to resolve some of these gaps. I was just, you know, giving my smile to Dan to make sure that the message goes back to HPD, um, because this is a contentious point here. And time and time again, every project comes in the same way. And if HPD does not begin to address this, doesn't matter how many affordable projects you have, you're losing families. And so this is not meant for 
families of New York City to be secured, but to have to pigeonhole them into categories that are not reflecting the flexibility that the city should have. And you have the oversight powers and the opportunity to correct, rectify this issue. Um, and it's not the first time we've raised it, and it won't be the last. The unit mix favors studio and one bedroom apartments. It is Borough President Adams' understanding that other than senior housing, family sized affordable housing units are highest in demand. And you had heard the conversation prior with the last application. What consideration can be given to providing an affordable housing unit mix that favors uh, two and three family, two and three bedroom units um, into your blended model? And what you have gone through, the two and three bedroom units reflects 30%, a third of your project. A third of the project, correct. So is this the original unit distribution or did this change? I, think, I don't, when we met, was it small, was this slightly smaller project? No. Yeah, I think when we met it was a slightly, yeah, so I think when we met the first time, we hadn't, we, there was so little uncertainty on 1612 and 1614, Fulton Street being in the project, so I think I presented like a smaller 62 unit project. Um, and so since we finally were able to acquire 1612 and 1614, mm -hmm. that allowed us the opportunity to, to expand up to 96, right? But, but that's, so that, stays, that has stayed pretty constant. Um, so the 30% that you see here has kind of been tracking the, the volume of the, of the project. And so as, as we look at these unit distributions by bedrooms and the demand of two and three bedroom apartments, mm -hmm. we want to see what is a favorable 50-50 distribution of 50% two and three bedrooms as opposed to just a third. And the income brackets obviously not letting families fall off. The project right now favors studios and one bedrooms. And there is no accommodation for what would be a senior on a fixed income. Correct. And so to go up to 165% of AMI and no senior accommodation for preference at the studio and one bedroom on a fixed income, we don't see the favorable accommodation of affordable housing for Brooklyn Nights. And we'd like that to be addressed so that we're able to have a blended model to accommodate the different groups of singles and family families. distribution. Well, to address, so to, to try to, you know, to address the, the, the seniors part of it, I mean, I think, I don't know if I mentioned, but the, 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 the vouchers I would try to target for, for seniors, right? Um, but that, you know, that's, that's eight apartments to try to serve uh, the ever-increasing senior population of not only Brooklyn, but this, you know, New York City in general. Um, in terms of the, you know, in terms of the, the, the bedroom distribution, I hear what you're saying, and I, I will go back to HPD and try to work with them. I mean, you know, it becomes like one of these things, right? So the more, if it becomes, if it's 50-50, we, we don't end up with 96 apartments. We end up with 80 apartments or something, right? So, But again, you know, it's quality versus quantity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I have to talk to my colleagues at HPD and, you know, your office and try to negotiate the best, you know, compromise for, because I think, you know, the administration places a pri priority on quantity, right? So to, to an extent, right? So and I think I have to. Not our priority. No, but, but yeah, quality. yeah, but in your, whereas yours may be the, will be, will be the quality. So we have to like find that, you know, find that, 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 try to navigate that fine line so we can get, um, you know, the most affordable housing and the, the best quality affordable housing. I don't see, unless I don't know the demographics in the homeless shelters, I don't know that there's 
families in the homeless shelters at 165,000, 165% of AMI mm -hmm. qualifying for these units, right? So the quantity was supposed to be accommodating what would be uh, 62,000 individuals homeless, right? Um, that's what we're pushing, supposedly, to achieve uh, where New Yorkers are ending up in a shelter as opposed to being uh, mm -hmm. in permanent housing. And so there's not a correlation, and we're trying to reach that correlation. Understood. Uh, I am going to excuse myself. Richard is trying to keep me on a time schedule here. So I will leave uh, Richard and Olga in charge of the rest of this hearing. I apologize for my You leave my party early. Absence. <laughs> <laughs> you got lucky. I want to make sure that um, we continue our conversations and thank you for just the thorough presentation. Um, and I look forward to uh, the transformation of what we've spoken about and application of the recommendations. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, it is the borough president's policy to promote the use of sustainable and renewable energy resources, as we mentioned the other items, uh, focused on advancing a sustainable future in Brooklyn. It is borough president's policy also to promote practices to retain stormwater runoff. What consideration has been given possibly in cooperation with DEP, Mayor's Office of Sustainability, NYSERDA, or NYPA, towards incorporating, for example, passive house design, solar panels, and you have height here for wind turbines again uh, on your roof, whether it be a blue, green, or at least a white roof covering, permeable pavers, um, although you don't really have open space because you have a rooftop there uh, over to retail, and also on the, along Fulton Street, for example, having bioswales. Um, so let me try to tackle the hardest one first. Just, I know the passive Any, house anyway. part of it. Um, and I think, you know, the, um, the, the, you know, the passive house piece of it is probably the, the, the most difficult to, to manage at this point, just from a, from a cost perspective, because I, I think, um, you know, there is some increased cost. I mean, after our last meeting, I did talk to the folks that, um, that are doing the, the, uh, this, the you know, the, the Hannock folks, um, and they, they, you know, told me it was about a, you know, 30 to $40 square foot premium over what they would have otherwise done, um, which unfortunately we couldn't, we couldn't um, absorb here. Um, and I think the, you know, I think uh, not, on, not until some time will we be able to underwrite to a significant um, M&O savings that I know, are, I know are definitely possible through passive house design. I, mean, I know for a fact that, that, that your utility consumption has to be significantly less. Um, however, the agencies still require you to underwrite to just, you know, the, the standards that they, that they know. So that there's, there's still, there's always going to be that disconnect until those, those pieces of it are reconciled. You know, that being said, I, I'm not, you know, I'm doing a de facto passive house project in the East Village right now. And so, you know, I'm not averse to it. I think that's where the industry is headed. And I think, you know, I am uh, more than happy to, to uh, explore it for certain. Now that I know that that's something that you um, and the deputy board president are very adamant about from the beginning, right? Um, I kind of learned of your love of it a little late in the game. So I apologize for that. Um, that being said, though, I did hire a passive house certified firm. Right, and they are, you know, um, I'm big fans of theirs, and you know, for on many fronts, and I think uh, I think they're they're ahead of the curve uh, on that piece, and I hope to do more business with them, and I think, you know, um, if I am ever so fortunate to come back to you in another public hearing, I think that it'll probably be for some kind of passive house thing that I worked out. Well, as um, you continue your career, at least yes. now that it's part of your vocabulary as yeah. you move forward, if we don't have the victory today, maybe we'll get success with you in future projects in Brooklyn, exactly. whether they're market rate or affordable. Or affordable. Um, and so, and then moving on to the um, the other elements. I mean, I think we could look at some at some some turbines. Yeah, I don't know what the wind. Um, you know, I probably have to do a wind study to see what the. I've never been out there that, and felt it to be that windy, but I think some micro turbines could be possible and we could power something, right? Um, and then in terms of the, I've been like struggling with NYSERDA to understand like on a roof of this size, how, how I could get it to make economic sense. 
but that's that's not to say that the incentives aren't aren't going to increase. I mean, we still have about you know eight or nine months before we actually break ground. So I think we can spend some more time trying to understand if there's if there's uh, some opportunities with Nyserda. Um and I th we will have a white roof. I think, and you know, some, it'll be something like R30 at the end of the day. Um, so that's that's something we can commit to. Um, Bioswills. I don't know if we can do that here. We have, cause, yeah, we, you know, we we have the A and C right in front of us on Fulton Street. Um, but look, Richard, I think you know, um, you know, you're somewhat preaching to the choir. I think that uh, the, the the industry and the building code clearly are headed in that direction. And so a lot of us are playing catch up uh, to, to the extent and we're you know, trying to find the cost savings on the, on the bidding process. Um, but I think you know, you're gonna start to see more, uh, at least from my perspective, you're gonna see more, um, more you maybe not passive house per se, but passive house-esque passive house projects um, coming, in, coming in to, to see you. And I think that's a testament to you and to you guys pushing, pushing that. Um, I think I answered most of that. Yeah. Case. Okay. Appreciate that. Um, and again, if you want to look outside, although it's dark, you'll see the wind turbines on the top of uh, building at 388 Bird Street. Not sure what the performance is, but you know we know they're there and they're sculptural and. Yeah, no, they're know. they're beautiful. I mean, that, but but they also have 400 feet on us or 300 feet on us. So you know, I think um, no, I'm a, I, I, they're they are great. I just you know I think we could we could do a study and see. If, yeah, and, and as long as the roof structure you're building, even if you don't do it initially, but the roof structure you're building and there is a program at some later date and you're able to then, you know, expand on what you're able to do because it will affect your operating costs in a positive way. Mm -hmm. um, Borough President also has policy, as we've mentioned before, to maximize good quality jobs for Brooklynites. If you could outline what steps will be taken to ensure the inclusion of participation of minority and women-owned business enterprises, as well as local business enterprises, in the process of the construction of this site. Sure. Well, we're. Um, I think, as you are aware, HPD is implementing a, a program called MWB Build Up, which is going to basically uh, carve out a percentage of uh, the city's contribution uh, directly through subsidy and also HDC's contribution, as well as any subordinated land value come up with a number. Um, it's probably going to be a, in a project of this size, of this cost, a relatively large seven-figure number that has to be committed to MWB contracts. Um, I mean, I don't, I, you know, I, I frankly have no problem with that. I'm glad that the agency is pushing in that direction. Um, so uh, we will definitely you know, commit to that and, and do better if, we're, if possible. And, the other day at the community board meeting, I also committed to hiring from the bedside community as much as possible um, and uh, soliciting bids from, from local contractors in that respect. And, and as you move along through the project, if you could share occasionally the results of uh, your hiring in that regard. Sure, absolutely. Well, the, um, the build-up program has a, has a heavy uh, reporting component to it, which um, you know, it has penalties if they're not uh, if you know if the goals aren't met uh, with good faith, um, there are some serious penalties. So uh, nobody wants to spend money on penalties. So I think we're going to do it, do the best we can to, to hit those numbers. Great. Okay. Thank you. I have no further questions, but we do have a speaker signed up. Okay. Idris Abdullah, if you could come up and. Uh, good evening. My name is Idris Abdullah. I'm a resident of the uh, local three area, also a member of the community board, and I sit on the committee for economic development as well as uh, land use. And I can definitely say, you know, with a strong, sincere effort, um, this team here has came before our board at least five or six times, and I think we've been talking with them and they've been doing a presentation for almost about a year, a little more than a year and a half. And every time the board have requested something or something uh, or, or made a suggestion on something that we was not comfortable with, this, this was one particular team that always went back and came back to try to suffice and figure out what ways that we were able to work or what ways or what was some of the things that we was comfortable with. And they really worked hard. Um, we have, if you know Community Board 3, they are, we are a hard board. 
And this was one team that we was extremely hard on, but we can definitely say they, they came with a strong effort. If we felt that the color of the bricks was not the right color, you know, our, our, our committee chairperson said, listen, we want to change this color. And they definitely came back again and again. You know, but I, uh, in reference to a project such as this, this will definitely enhance the richness of the Bethesda Davis and development, uh, uh, the, the development of that, the community over there. And uh, again, I, you know, we definitely welcome Juan and his team. And if we can get more developers to understand and be more uh, acceptive to some of the requests that the community board members put on the table, I think the community would definitely, definitely go a long way. And uh, we would like to definitely thank them you know, publicly because they really put a strong effort into making sure that we got exactly what we, what we needed. Maybe we, 10, on a scale of one to 10, I think we must have got at least nine and a half of the, the requests. You know, so we thank them again, you know, and we definitely looking forward to working with them. And hopefully, like I said, we're gonna be looking forward, we're definitely working with them with local hiring and things like that in the future. But again, I wanna thank them, and the board would like to thank them. And that was one of the reasons why we were so adamant and really uh, giving them that letter of support. You know, so again, we thank y'all, and we definitely look forward to having them doing work in the community. Thank, Thank you. you. If you could just stay for a second. So yes. I know you're not here in your community board no. capacity, but exactly. obviously since you are a member of Land Use Committee, yes. um, given what has been shared on a few items tonight in terms of uh, borough president typically seeking to have more two and three bedroom apartments, mm -hmm. even though it might reduce the overall number of units, I wouldn't mm -hmm. ask you to put you in position to respond tonight, exactly. but you may want to take it back for discussion within the committee to get a sense Obviously, you could deviate from project to project, yes, but yes. as a general theme, where does the board find itself in terms of wanting to promote more two and three bedrooms, or it's not really an issue? It'd be something for us to get great feedback from. Definitely. So maybe at your next committee meeting, you may yes. want to introduce the dialogue of discussion. Yes, we definitely will. Thank you. Thank and again, you. we thank uh, BRP and Mr. Guan for their support. So we have no further speakers signed up in this item, but if there are anybody else who is here, who has not signed a speaker slip that would like to speak on this matter, uh, you could certainly come up now. Okay, seeing none. So we're gonna now move on to calendar item number four, 170029ZMK and 170030ZRK. And we thank you for your patience tonight, team. And the Applications submitted by the Institute for Community Living seek to rezone the southwest corner of the intersection of Nevin Street and Skirmahorn Street in the downtown Brooklyn section and adjacent Borham Hill section of Community District 2 from a C6-1 district to a C6-4 district and designate the rezoning a mandatory inclusionary housing area. Such actions would facilitate the reconstruction and enlargement of an existing eight-story building by adding a 10-story horizontal expansion above an existing underutilized parking lot and a three-story addition to the existing building. Uh, the new development would include 120 affordable and supportive housing units in the blended existing and new construction with 4,107 square feet of community, uh, I'm sorry, of ground floor retail space Community Board 2 will be voting on this application on May 10th. The Borough President will hold off in making any decisions until he hears from the Community Board. Um, will the representative for the application, Carolyn Harris, please state your name for the record and present the application. And again, thank you for your patience. Sure. Uh, good evening, Mr. Barak and Miss. Oh, no. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name's Caroline Harris, a partner at Goldman Harris. We represent the applicant, ICL. I'm accompanied tonight uh, by Nick Ori, who's the CFO of ICL, and John Wolfling, architect at Datner Architects. And they will assist me in my presentation. Um, as you have identified, this is a proposed rezoning, and there'll be a mapping of a mandatory inclusionary housing district as a text uh, amendment as well. Um, on the uh, portion 
Um, the rezoning is for a portion of lot 37 on block 172, which currently is, um, the, the map currently has an R6B for 32% of the lot and a C61 for 68% of the lot. And the proposal is to change the zoning for the 68% of the lot from C61 to uh, C64. Um, what that will facilitate is the retention um, of an existing building, uh, which is the current home of ICL's Stepping Stone program, which currently houses, um, it's currently uh, seven stories plus a penthouse and contains 150 SRO units. These are all supportive housing units for homeless, formerly homeless, and um, we were criticized for calling them mentally ill. M perhaps the term is now mentally challenged? Mental health issues. Mental, people with mental health issues that are severe. Um, there is uh, a new model being uh, evolving in the mental health um, field uh, to mainstream people with mental health issues to the extent that it's appropriate, safe, and feasible rather than to isolate them and stigmatize them through the isolation. In order to accomplish that goal, this wonderful building uh, is proposed to be enlarged with both a vertical enlargement, a uh, small vertical enlargement of two stories on the rooftop, and a horizontal enlargement which will be constructed in a parking lot which is part of the same tax lot 37 owned by ICL. Currently the tax, the parking lot is used for parking and for garbage. And in the proposal, uh, once the rezoning takes place, the parking lot would then be the base for a horizontal enlargement of the building. And as John and I have now done, I would be the short uh, existing buildings and John would be the new building to well bridge, bridge over the existing building. Um, in order to accomplish that, the higher zoning district would allow more floor area. It would mitigate an overbuild that exists on 50 Nevins right now because it's all in an R6B. It's a, a grandfathered noncompliance. This building is a very old and distinguished building. It is not designated as a city landmark but uh, does have a distinguished history um, as being the first uh, YWCA, was it the first? I'm not sure. It may not be the first, but it's a, it was a very early YWCA um, and was originally constructed with this sort of SRO type of unit. In the new project, the SRO units will be eliminated. All of the units will be apartments. Uh, they'll be supportive housing units um, but for fully main, mainstreaming the people with mental health issues. So there'll be zero, one bedrooms, two bedroom, three bedroom apartments, including uh, families with a member who has mental illness. Um, there'll be a split. Not all of the units will be uh, supported, uh, supportive housing. It'll be a 60-40% split. Um, the funding for the project is coming through both OMH and HPD. So a uh, percentage of the units are going to be for people whose families, uh, I can't say they don't have mental health issues, but they're not mental health issues that are a part of this program <laughs> um, and um, are not recognized as people who are in great need of support um, or, or in any need of support. Uh, so the number of units that will result actually reduces the number of units from 150 to 128 units, but these units will be larger and allow for all independent living, including um, two bedroom apartments and some threes and threes. Um, let me see what else I can tell you. There'll be uh, 51 units that are for the general population 
and 77 units that would be more uh, programmatically identified as the supportive housing units. But on each floor and throughout the building, you would not know which unit is which. There will be supportive services in the building. There'll be a 24-hour uh, front desk that can address any issues that come up during any hours, and there'll be counselors on staff and in the building during the daytime. There'll be a community room, and um, uh, there's also space that's designated for commercial, or uh, we'll discuss what other uses might be there. I'm gonna let uh, John take over and show you the, uh, let, let me just, in terms of context, I guess you should know about the context. It's very close to the Boreham Hill neighborhood. It sort of nestled between Boreham Hill and downtown Brooklyn. In terms of height, uh, the height allowance here is 140 feet, uh, as proposed. Uh, we'll only be going up to about 120. The building next door, which is a hotel, you can see it in the, this photograph, this mock-up, uh, that's about 140. And that's allowed because of the special downtown Brooklyn district allows a height of up to 140 along this corridor for the zoning district that we're pro proposing. It's a height limit area B. So there you can see it's between Boreham Hill and downtown Brooklyn, a little ways from Fort Greene. The site is an L-shaped site. Um, ICL owns three buildings that are to the west, to the left on this picture, that are not part of this project. They currently, those three buildings currently serve a similar population as exists in the building now but they will not be incorporated into this program. The people who live in the building now, in this uh, 50 Nevins now, will be relocated to other ICL facilities during the construction. To the extent that any of those people are um, capable of independent living, they'll be eligible to be moved back into the project. Uh, this map obviously shows the current zoning as R6B and C61 and shows where the um, C64 district, which is on the opposite side of Shermerhorn, will be brought over to this side of the street. And it's only going to be covering, as I, it will not be changing the R6B along straight, State Street. So State Street portion of the lot will remain R6B. And I should add the prior zoning when it was R6 and you were allowed through special permit to have 4.8 FIR. So through a city action, you were reduced from 4.8 to 2.0. So I guess you could say it's sort of returning that floor area that the city made non-conforming and non-compliant. Is now becoming compliant through, the, through this project, exactly. Uh, there are other uh, tall buildings along Shermerhorn, so this building would not be uh, in any way uh, a, th a finger standing up in the neighborhood. Um, up and down Shermerhorn, there are various buildings that are taller, as it is a taller height district than what uh, is mapped for the C61 right now. Um, so these are area photos. Land use, um, it's a, Shermerhorn is mixed use. Um, variety of housing, hotels, and so on. Um, and this building is, it's currently being used for this not-for-profit purpose and it will continue to be used uh, as such. So I'll let uh, John take over from here and describe the, the building's changes. We have, Nick will come back to to address uh, more details about the uh, composition of the units and any questions that you have will be happy to answer. Good evening. My name is John Wolfling from Datner Architects. Uh, we are a firm that specializes in affordable and supportive housing and we are excited to be working on this project. The, uh, this photograph that you see on the screen is uh, what the building currently looks like but without the bridging. Um, and one of the things that really struck me about the project is how um, handsome the existing building is. So our design partee or approach 
is to really respect that, respect the historic character of the building. We are uh, retaining the, the grand cornice at the top of the building, and um, uh, when we expand the building, there, okay, sorry, skip ahead, okay. So when we, when we expand the building in the parking lot and vertically and around the, uh, the existing building, we're gonna be matching up our floor to floors, matching up the windows, uh, and having a similar scale window and having a similar, or ha having a relationship between the new and the existing building, but also distinguishing the two volumes uh, through brick color, through fenestration patterns, and also uh, with, with a monumental reveal where the two buildings, where the two masses come together. You can see that going vertically up at the joint along Skirmerhorn. Skirmerhorn is the main street uh, that you're seeing in the, in the foreground. Nevins goes off uh, and back to the left. Uh, so there's a reveal that goes up vertically and then turns around and wraps around where these two masses come together. There's also a ground floor um, uh, potential commercial or community facility space that would be located on Skirmerhorn, which is, I think, the, the ideal location for that, where there's the highest uh, foot traffic. Um, we're not quite sure what that, uh, that component is going to be. It obviously has to work with the project's uh, financial um, uh, model. Which direction? Okay, there we go. Uh, so these are some earlier massing studies that we did. Uh, you can see how uh, even in the early stages of the design we were uh, very um, interested in this idea of these two masses and how they integrate and wrapping them around one of the things that we are proposing to do, which we have gone to uh, SHPO, uh, the State Historic Preservation Office, uh, we are proposing to take off the building's existing crown so that we can have a real um, clear relationship between those two masses, between the existing building and the, uh, the expansion. And here's another view looking down Skirmerhorn. Skirmerhorn is the, the main street that you see going off uh, to the right-hand side. Uh, and you start to see more of the relationship between the, uh, the historic building, uh, the banding, and how that picks up on the, finis the, the fenestration patterns and the, the subtle floor-to-floor uh, -floor, uh, patterning. Um, one of the things that we are doing in the building um, that makes it a very efficient development is we are matching the floor-to-floors between the existing building and the new building, that allows us to have a very efficient set of stairs and elevators. Uh, we're also making the building handicap accessible uh, through some pretty significant uh, modifications to the ground floor of the building. Right now, when you get up to the building, you have to go up a few steps, you come into a foyer, then you have to go up a few more steps. Uh, it's very difficult for uh, people with disabilities to navigate, so we're gonna rectify that by dropping a significant portion of the ground floor down providing a lift, a handicap lift, and some stairs that are much easier to navigate, um, and really making a residential building out of this. Uh, Carrie mentioned uh, some of the details for the existing building and how it functions. One of the uh, programmatic items that ICL gave us the, uh, or charged us with doing was making this into a real residential building. So there will be um, a compactor room for garbage storage, uh, there's bike storage, uh, in the cellar, there's laundry facilities, so it really is going to become a, a contemporary and uh, appropriate um, uh, residential building for, for its, uh, its users. This is a, um, the ground floor plan, uh, primarily to, to indicate the commercial area that is the, the green hatch on the top right-hand side, uh, so Skirmerhorn is, is uh, on the right-hand side of the page. So it's a fairly deep, uh, large, uh, well, not terribly large, but uh, uh, a nice size space uh, that could be uh, fitting for uh, a variety of uses. That's really the end of the design presentation. What's that? Oh, yes, yeah, sorry, thank you for reminding me. There, there is a, uh, one other component that we are going to be uh, maintaining in the facility, and it's to the left-hand side, there's a community room that um, is um, a fairly large space, about 1,000 square feet, and it's currently not available 
I believe through some programmatic restrictions with the, with the existing uh, buildings programming. Uh, but it's, it will be, the idea is that it will be made available for um, the neighborhood and the community to have meetings. Um, and it's a beautiful historic space. We're going to re retain it. We're going to uh, 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 bring it back and, and do any sort of repair work that's needed for the detailing. Uh, but it's a real, it'll be a real public amenity. Yes. Um, there are supportive, uh, uh, Carrie mentioned the supportive services that are available to the residents that, uh, that may be uh, in need of them. Those offices are just to the right hand side. You can see the elevators um, kind of between the yellow and the green area on the right hand side. So those, those offices are located uh, in prime locations so that as people walk in, there is a very low barrier to have access to the services. It's almost like a walk-in um, configuration. So if someone uh, has kind of had a, a bad day, they can easily walk in there and have uh, counseling services if they need them. Um, anything else that I forgot? <laughs> okay. Are there any questions that you'd like to ask that you'd like us to sure. answer? Sure. So for both the low income and the supportive housing units, what is the qualifying income range for the prospective tenants? And what are the anticipated rents? And then how long are these units required to be rented at the affordable rates? I'd like to turn answers to those questions on financing over to uh, Nick Ori, who's the CFO. Thank you, Carrie. So Nick, if you could say your name for the record as part of it, and you could lift the mic up yeah, just for being the taller building. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. My name is Nick Ori. I am the Institute for Community Living, or ICL, CFO. Uh, and to, <clears throat> to answer your questions, as Carrie mentioned before, there will be a total of 128 units, of which 60% of the units will be uh, for the supportive housing, which will be supported by OMH, Office of Mental Health. The goal for those units will be a breakdown between studios of 60, two bedrooms of, apologize, 10, and three bedrooms of four, all at a 50% AMI. And the current AMI, 50% AMI off the HPD for an individual is $33,400. Um, those units will also be receiving either project-based Section 8 uh, vouchers or similar New York, City, New York City rental subsidies, either through the Empire Supportive Housing Initiative, ESHI, or other RFPs that potentially OMH will be producing for us. This is a line of business that ICL does on a regular basis, providing community-based supportive housing. Uh, we currently have over 1,500 supportive housing units all throughout the five boroughs of New York City. So we have a very good relationship with OMH and work with many different <coughs> funders, including local city agencies such as DOHMH to provide those services. And as both John and Carrie had mentioned, the building is also being set up to provide those services to the building at large as well. Uh, we are purposely building those um, support services right on the first floor, not just for the residents of that 60% supportive housing, but potentially if their need is available for the affordable housing side, it can be available as well. Okay, and then, so, in it, so the spaces, what would the typical services that you'd be providing on site? Um, under the OMH regulations, um, typically a supportive housing has a case manager assigned to them. There's usually a case mix of a certain number of individuals to one case manager. Uh, the good part of having majority of these units in one location, it could all be centralized, makes it a little bit easier and more efficient. So case management services are provided. And then depending upon the need of the individual, so depending upon which uh, RFP or subsidy we would get, it would determine what type of individual is put into the building. So a simple example, if substance abuse was uh, an area of focus and that's what the population goes in there, we would potentially have somebody with substance abuse counseling background. Or if there was some additional clinical services due to medical management or something like that. So it's really flexible based on the type of clients that we would be putting into the building. Okay, thank you. Um, an issue that's been for the borough president has to do with the uh, decrease in funding for the arts. 
and it's resulted in many cultural and dance organizations that are now desperately seeking assistance in securing affordable space to grow and sustain their programming. And given the transit accessibility, downtown Brooklyn, the proximity to the BAM cultural corridor, basically going from issue room project mm -hmm. down um, to the church um, on Lafayette that uh, has space there as well, um, and obviously BAM and other spaces that have been built on the, on the, uh, the BAM LDC sites. Mm -hmm. um, the borough president believes that this location is well suited for the inclusion of cultural and or dance activities. And however, many of these organizations are not able to compete with the rent that retail uses would likely pay at this location. So what steps might your organization be willing to take in order to provide affordable <coughs> cultural in the retail space of this building? Uh, and that's a great question, and I think, you know, ICL is a not-for-profit first, so, you know, we are a mission-driven organization, but we also have to balance that with the financial models established through HPD, as well as the construction costs and other factors. But with that being said, we've actually reached out to, um, I apologize for forgetting the cultural arts organization that we met with, actually, John, do you remember? Um, which is based in East, uh, downtown Brooklyn. So we've already started to engage with other not-for-profits, especially in the cultural and arts areas, to see what the potential synergies could be. Uh, so we absolutely take that seriously. And as we have our financial models built a little bit further along over the next six months to eight months, I think we'll have a better answer for you. But we absolutely are going to focus our attention on what the needs of both the community is, but as the building and the residents. As, as you know, uh, this project is one, not just 100% affordable, but it's affordable at a, at a low level, and all of the funding is coming from government programs. So um, I, I think ICL would be delighted to work with the borough president if you're aware of either other additional subsidy programs that could help support the rent, a, a, a lower rent for the, uh, the space that we've identified as a commercial space. Originally, there was a thought of having a fresh foods in this space. Now there's a desire for cultural organizations. Um, as long as it can pencil out and if there's support to help move it in that direction, um, ICL would be happy to talk with you about it. But even if that's not available, the, the community room is something that could be available from time to time on a scheduled basis. It's a program, it would be programmed. Um, and so from time to time, arts groups or um, artists, what, whatever, could use it for meetings or for rehearsal space, um, even for, I suppose, rehearsals that might benefit, be enjoyable for the people who live in the building. Um, as uh, Nick said, ICL is very community-minded. It also has to balance that with the cost. So any uh, input that you can provide or suggestions, we'd be delighted to listen to them. And if you have thoughts, not necessarily now, but in terms of what might be the gaps between what uh, cultural groups may share that they might be able to pay in rent versus how that will affect what you've written in for your hopeful rent and then to figure out how that translates into dollars based on the size in terms of what that might be in terms of a, uh, a funding um, mesh that kind of gets you whole and yet still accomplishes these other objectives. And I have to say, uh, one of the culturals that we've been in touch with a bit for, through the years, they're actually two blocks down. Uh, they're in Skimmerhorn House, uh, Brooklyn Ballet, and they're bursting at the seams with their success at just one. And so I'm certainly dialoguing with some of the groups that are involved uh, in the BAM projects. Um, used to be known as BAM South, it might be 300 Ashland now, I'm not sure what the name, the Two Trees Project. I know they've, uh, in terms of doing that deal, had to have a certain amount of cultural in there as well, so some of those organizations are definitely worth chatting with and feeling them out for their sense of ability to pay and if we understand their ability to pay versus what you need, we might start understanding to quantify that as a dollar, as a gap. That, that's terrific, and we're looking forward to working with you. I'm sure ICL is happy to work with you. If you want to share the names of those organizations, if they don't know it, that would be very helpful. Um, or I can give you a call and we can follow up. Sure. Well, there's time we could start and uh, connecting, and we also have cultural staff 
here so we can try to reach out to some of these local organizations to work Terrific. with you. It's the borough president's policy, as we've mentioned in other ULIP items, in terms of sustainable renewable energy resources, focusing on advancing a sustainable future in Brooklyn. And it's the borough president's policy to promote practices to retain stormwater runoff. And we'd like to know what consideration has been given um, in possibly working with, say, DEP grants, uh, Mayor's Office of Sustainability, NYSERDA, NYFA, towards incorporating. We know passive house doesn't work in the context of the addition, but for example, incorporating solar panels, you have height where perhaps wind turbines might work, blue green or at least a white roof covering, uh, permeable pavers for any open areas, and then on the street level, sidewalk level, perhaps not on Skimmerhorn because of the subway, but perhaps on the uh, Nevin side, bioswales. I defer to John to answer this question. Uh, so many of those things I think are, are possible. Um, and I think one of the critical things for the project is uh, can they be put in initially with the, the budget that we have? Uh, I think some of the things that you mentioned are, are almost no cost, like a high albedo roof, a white roof, or a green roof um, is a relatively low cost item. Something like solar panels, they're a little more expensive uh, and, a, and a little bit more of an investment. Uh, one of the things that we will be doing uh, is making the building solar ready which means putting a conduit in place through the building so that you could easily pull feeders, electrical feeders, to, at a later date, put in the right equipment, solar panels, the inverters, and then bring the power down to the main switch gear in the, in the cellar. So that's a, a very easy, actually th something that we, it's easily done and something that we are doing because we are complying with the Enterprise Green Communities Checklist because of the, it is a HPD requirement to do that. So that's, uh, that's something we're gonna be doing. Um, we uh, have considered passive house for the project, and much like some of the earlier presentations, um, uh, we are uh, knowledgeable about it. We're actually working, my office is working on two uh, passive house projects in the city. Um, it is not a great fit for this building uh, for a variety of technical reasons, um, whether it's the existing building that has uh, multiple thermal bridges that are very difficult to get around, um, the existing floor to floor heights, with uh, Passive House, there is an energy recovery ventilation system uh, that requires a slightly higher floor to floor, so that really can't be integrated into the existing building. The new building is being, the floor to floor heights are being dictated by the existing building's floor to floor height, so I hate to be uh, such a, mention all these challenges, but it, they really are real challenges for adapting an existing building. Uh, but we're doing the things that we can, uh, the solar ready, uh, the high albedo or green roof. Uh, we are also going to be doing a, uh, a highly efficient uh, heating and cooling system. Uh, it's a variable refrigerant flow system. And that's being dictated primarily by uh, the fact that we have this existing uh, building that we don't want to start punching holes through it. Uh, a typical solution for affordable housing or supportive housing is to put a PTAC or a through wall air conditioner sleeve in. We don't want to do that because that would really denigrate the existing uh, building's character. So we're going to do a VRF system, which doesn't require all of those openings. It does require compressors. They're basically split systems, so you, um, uh, you move the heat outside f through use of refrigerant. Um, but it's a very efficient system. So that's one of the things that we're, we're doing uh, just because of the very nature of the project. So I think we're doing what we can. Um, uh, and I, I do think, pass, someone said it earlier tonight, Passive House is really the direction that the industry is going, and I agree with that. Uh, but it's not a great fit for this project. At least uh, continuing projects for ICL as you increase your inventory, to have that dialogue as you move forward to yeah. future projects, that'd be great. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And the final question I have is, Borough President, uh, we've mentioned four uh, policy to maximize good quality job for Brooklynites. And if you could outline what steps would be taken to ensure the inclusion of participation of minority and women business-owned enterprises and local business enterprises in the process of the construction of the site. Similar to, uh, as some of the people prior to me had said, is because this is an HPD project, there is going to be a certain requirement of certain dollars uh, being applicable to the MWBE. Um, ICL is absolutely for this. We've got, we have numerous contracts currently with other funders that have very similar requirements. We've got a very sophisticated system internally to monitor, manage, bid, 
uh, and to include MWBE uh, vendors. Uh, we use the New York State approved vendor listing, which includes the MWBE population. We're also working with uh, construction companies that are very familiar and knowledgeable about this um, regulations and are also applicable. As also mentioned previously, we will have numerous compliance requirements to ensure uh, that we meet the requirements associated with this and HP and HPD and ICL are working concurrently to make sure that will happen appropriately. And as for Brooklyn itself, um, majority of ICL's programs are actually in Brooklyn and majority of the employees that we actually have that are boots on the ground are from Brooklyn as well and many of the other boroughs. So, you know, we are always looking to hire where our look programs are. Um, you know, ICL has over 1,200 employees, and I don't cut, quote me on the exact amount, but probably about 70% of the programs and about 70% of our employees are in the Brooklyn area. Thank you. I'm glad you also brought up the actual operational side of the employees in terms of local hiring. I appreciate that. So no further questions. I have no signed speakers in this item, so if there's anybody who is not Sign a speaker slip that would like to speak in this item. Uh, so hearing none. So the hearing on these items that we've heard tonight are closed. Uh, thank you for participating in this public hearing. Borough President Adams will review all the applications we've heard today and will soon submit his recommendations to the City Planning Commission. Borough President Adams would like to take this opportunity to remind you that the City Planning Commission will hold public hearing on all the items. This, this hearing and the, all the other hearings uh, were now adjourned. And Borough President Adams would like to remind those viewing on the website that timely comments can be submitted by email to askeric at brooklynbp.nyc.gov. Thank you. Thank you.